Hello again everyone, this is Steve D of the YYT with another Legend Spotlight Deck Tech Talk for the variety of Legends in Opus 12. Today we're going to be covering Faris. Faris is a bit of a strange one. I both had multiple requests saying please do Faris uh, for on, uh, other videos on the channel and I also had multiple requests saying please don't do Faris, uh, please, please leave Faris out or leave Faris until the last of the Legends because uh, it wasn't really believed that he uh, held all that much potential. Initially, I was one of those people. I didn't really care for Faris. I was all set in, during spoiler season for Opus 12 for it to be like a fire water steiner, maybe. After seeing the full art Beatrix and stuff so early on in spoiler season, I was sure this was going to be like the Final Fantasy IX set, and I was going through all different characters, maybe even Zorn and Thorn or something, that this could have been. And so I was a little bit disappointed initially when I saw Faris, another Faris, yay, Faris, as the water and fire dual element legend and I was even more annoyed I suppose when I saw oh great it's warrior of light support. I am not a fan of tribal decks. I think there is an inherent flaw in the logic of tribal decks where you are devoting your entire deck to a particular concept or a particular job or something and that's a real shame because they're so much fun. Practically everybody who plays FFTCG who I know well has come here because they like Final Fantasy or like the community foremost and because they like card games second. That's not an indictment on the card game as a card game, but it hasn't attracted over many of the Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic players and stuff. And because of that, I think there is a much more sentimental link, or certainly a sentimental vein, goes through FFTCG's player base than any other card game of the many I have played over the years. And this sentimental streak will usually make people want to build a deck around their favourite game. And that's why title format is a good idea. And I think that tribal decks are a sort of extension of that. People who like or came into Final Fantasy through Final Fantasy XIV might have a soft spot or an attachment to Scions of the Seventh Dawn. And I can imagine a lot of people wanted to build an FF9 tribal deck as well, because that's a really popular one. There, of course, there's Seven and things like that. So tribal decks are generally really popular among the community, but I think that particularly job-based tribal decks have always fallen short because if you devote too much to a particular concept and then you start to lose the game, you will never get back into the game. If your deck is too inherently bound around one particular synergy, then random cards that you flip off the top of the deck start to look a whole load worse by comparison when you don't already have something else on the field to combo with. And it's because of that that I think that even though we've gotten some periods of time where tribal decks looked pretty good, I know that in Opus 5, Scions were a very scary deck because a whole field of haste was a very difficult thing to answer at that time, and that was before cards like Fina were printed to kill multiple forwards at once. However, the deck still never really made it to the big time and never won any major events just because of this fallacy of tribal decks. Once a tribal deck starts losing, all of its cards that they are top decking will never be enough when viewed as a single card to get back into the game. I feel like Warriors of Light, this opus, have come closer to solving that problem than ever before. When the deck is going well, when things are going in Warriors of Light's terms, the deck is absolutely incredible and Faris is the best support that this tri tribe, deck, archetype, whatever, will ever get. Phenomenally strong card. I would say Faris does for Warriors of Light even better than what Edge did for Ninjas in the last opus. I'm, I'm that sold on Faris being a really great card and I would encourage everyone who is on the fence about this archetype to please give it a try. It's not just some dumb aggro deck. I think one of my least favourite cards ever printed was the Sol from Opus 7. Sol and by, to an extent I suppose Aegis as well. They were just really uninteractive and boring cards that you go discard, discard, forward, forward and that's kind of your entire game plan. You beat down with a bunch of 8Ks and 7Ks and stuff, and it's, it's not really interactive or interesting, not very compelling, and I can only imagine that if I was a newcomer to FFTCG and that was how I lost my very first game, I would probably either stop playing the game or play very differently. Hmm, sounds a little bit like Neo X Death these days, right? Enough of the anecdotes. We're gonna talk about some Warriors of Light. A big mistake, and this is a sort of example, a practical example of the tribal mistake that I think people make a lot of the time, are these Warriors of Light, the cycle from Opus 5. I do apologise that the camera is so very, very bright today. Time for one more anecdote. There's always room for one more anecdote. I was at Nationals in the UK in 2018. This was a Nationals that was invite only and stuff. You had to win a regional to get there at the time. And uh, it, it was a wonderful time. I, I just narrowly missed out on Top Cut that day playing my beloved Fire Ice. But for one of the side events on day two, for the unfortunate few who did not make Top Cut, I say few, there were about 60 of us, but uh, one of the events was a Hobby Japan side stall 
where somebody from the Square Enix team had got uh, a Warrior of Light deck and the challenge was come along and beat this Warrior of Light deck. And you've got to bear in mind that this was the opus where Mono Ice with Flans and Sid Alstein was at its absolute peak, maybe the best deck in the format. Dadalu Macactuar was still around, and also YRP was in its sort of uh, formative or, or mid stages there. So it was a very competitive room with a lot of archetypes that have stood the test of time. And I must have watched this side show, this, this little uh, side event, for about three hours, and not once did this Warrior of Light deck lose to the very hardest of the meta. Maybe this is a sign that uh, the, the wrong half of the room was playing, and maybe it would have been different if people who were in Top Cut had been playing against the guy. But uh, it was hysterical anyway, and I think that rumours of that day have made people think that these Warriors of Light are some kind of god-tier, untouchable card. I don't think that is remotely the case at all. And I think that decks that are trying to play all four of these colours onto the field are very unreliable, very slow, and a complete homogenate of cards that are doing the same thing. And it completely exemplifies the problem of when your cards are in isolation, the first Warrior of Light you play is very boring. It's just a 7k with no ability whatsoever. And it's only when you get start to get a few of them on the field that all of a sudden, oh yeah, after all of that homework, I now have a 3CP 9k. And aside from the fact that I don't think a 3CP 9k with no relevant text is particularly good anymore, it, the problem is with these cards. Nevertheless, I am still playing one for reasons I will go into in time. The reason it is Refia rather than Luneth in this deck is that I think that uh, Refia's ability to dull down five active water forwards and backups to return a forward to hand is more likely to be useful than Luneth dulling down three fire characters to do 2k ping. Who would dull three characters for a 2k ping? I don't think even Luneth notices he has that ability. Anyway, enough about my pet hates of these cards and why I am eventually going to explain why I'm playing one anyway. Back to Faris. Faris is a tremendously strong payload card. When she or another one of your Warriors of Light enters the field, you make the difficult choice of shooting one of your opponent's forwards for 2,000 damage for every forward Warrior of Light you have on the field, the forward part is important, or the next Warrior of Light of any card type that you play onto the field is reduced in cost by 2 this turn. This can do so many different things. One of the things that Warriors of Light was lacking in the past was sensible removal because you wanted to just play all of these garbage slow Warriors of Light and maybe eventually make this enormous pebble fort deck of, of a ton of 10Ks and uh, you would kind of neglect the removal and also if you were playing too many different colors, you didn't have room for removal. So Faris neatly solves that problem by giving an extra on entry ability to all of your Warriors of Light and the lack of tempo, the lack of agility behind these cards was always one of the big problems. The other thing Faris can do, knocking 2CP off the next Warrior of Light you play, is absolutely enormous as well. And paying 4 for Faris, but then 1 for a 3 cost Warrior of Light, 1 for another 3 cost Warrior of Light, is incredibly powerful. It really adds up very quickly, and your opponent has to answer Faris almost immediately, or they're in big trouble. However, 4CP is kind of a tricky blind spot for a lot of kinds of removal. Alexander only trades with it, Diabolus doesn't straight up kill it, Kuja in Lightning doesn't kill it. Your opponent is going to have to throw something, and usually something quite unusual, to kill a Faris that just entered the field that turn. The other important thing about Faris is that she reduces the cost of your Warriors of Light, regardless of whether they're a forward or a backup. I did the water set review for Opus 12 for the YYT. And uh, I think I was unnecessarily mean to Sarah FFL. Sarah FFL is a Warrior of Light backup, and indeed she had another backup, I think it was maybe back in Opus 7 or something as well, 7 CP, and you could search for a Warrior of Light of any element other than Light or Dark, of cost 4 or less, and play it straight onto the field. Sounds like a lot of conditions. At the time it seemed like a kind of a cool idea to play a copy of Earth Wall in your Mono Water deck or something, and I initially started building this as a 3 colour deck, just to make the most of Faris's abilities and play some, some slightly intriguing walls, but also I wanted to try and use the 7CP Sarah FFL. And then I kind of remembered that Sarah FFL actually has good text. She searches two cards for you, two Warriors of Light, when she enters the field, and if you can knock two off her price by playing another cheap Warrior of Light first, then paying 4CP for a backup that gives 4CP to your hand is actually an amazing slingshot for tempo. So she's a really, really good card in this archetype that is quite driven by its two card combos. Finding Faris and another thing for Faris to combo with, or finding something bigger than Faris that dumps Faris into play, both very strong things to do. And I still think uh, the action ability on Sarah FFL is garbage, but the fact she can remove herself is something kind of sweet, I suppose. 
Three copies of Aegis and two copies of Sol. I think the previous versions of these cards were kind of boring. The previous Aegis was a reasonably good stompy aggro card. The previous Sol was very much bound to you using him with Aegis. And I just don't, don't care for that style of play. However, this is different just because of how much of an engine Faris is on her own. Let's talk about Aegis first. Job Warrior of Light Forwards you control can form a party with Job Warrior of Light Forwards of any element. That isn't actually too relevant to this deck because uh, a lot of the time we want to be partying either things with Faris, Faris being water and fire, you can party her with any of your water or fire forwards anyway. The really important thing is when Aegis enters the field you can play a warrior of light from your hand of cost 4 or less and that lets us bypass the sometimes tricky colour restriction on Faris and just go boom boom Aegis Faris. This is most ideal on maybe turn 3 off of 3 backups uh, I have found in my testing with this deck and I've got to say for a tribal-ish deck this is is incredibly fun to play. On the other end of the scale we've got Sol, a very small 1cp 2k. Our 1cp 2k has haste if we control any other warrior of light forwards and we do have a lot of them in the deck so Sol is usually going to have haste. When he party attacks you search your deck for a warrior of light of cost two or more and add it to your hand. Importantly, you can find a backup. You can find Sarah FFL with this. Importantly, Faris's ability that reduces the cost of your next Warrior of Light, you can trigger that in main phase one by playing Sol before combat, and then that reduction will still be in effect by main phase two. So if you're a little bit lacking on backups or just want to replenish your hand, playing Sol for one CP to knock two CP off of a card that you don't even have in your hand yet is very, very powerful. I initially thought that Sol said search for a Warrior of Light of cost two or less, and I was a lot less excited about it then, but the fact is he searches for probably 80%, maybe even more than that, of the Warriors of Light in print. So if you want to try him a few other places, I actually think he's a really good card. The problem with small forwards, and the problem with party attacks in general up until now, has been that you are giving up too much of a resource in order to engage in the party attack. Small forwards can't really attack into much unless they party, but when you are partying, you are giving up the ability to attack with two individual things and deal two damage that turn, to just maybe deal one damage this turn, or your opponent jump blocks. However, Sol removes a lot of that weight because every time he gets to party attack, he's going to refund you a card. And 1cp 2k's that draw you a card on entry would see play, I guarantee it. So a 1cp 2k who might draw you a card every single turn until your opponent blocks the party or spends removal on this 2k, that's actually a really good card. The reason he's not at 3 copies is the same as the tribal fallacy I was saying earlier on. If you are not already ahead, if you are not already in a position to be attacking, it's very miserable to top deck a 1cp 2k who does not have haste. So only 2 copies, mostly we search him out when we're going to need him, or he shows up when we've already got another warrior of light on the field because he's not all that hot on his own. Riffia is another card who's exactly the same as Sol. We don't really want to top deck her unless we're ready to see her. And so she's a one-off silver bullet for the situations where we maybe get to play her for one CP. Mostly she's there because Sol searches her out. And I think that 1k means a little bit more when you only paid one for the privilege and when you can search it out on demand and then you're not going to top deck it if your board gets shantotoed or something. So Riffia is uh, slightly playable when searchable on demand, but I wouldn't play more than one copy and I probably wouldn't play Riffia and Lunith unless you can really find the space. Another Warrior of Light, playing three copies of the old Dusk from Opus 7. There is a new Dusk, he is I think a 7k for 3cp and you can pay one water on entry to make him play another 3cp or less when he enters the field. The reason I'm not playing that Dusk is I think that most of the cards in this deck cost four or more and it feels like they cost not all that much because of Faris's reduction effect across the board making all of your cards playable for a lower sum but Dusk didn't really feel like he had many targets in this deck and I felt like I was making a worse version of the deck if I bent it around having Dusk the other Dusk able to play them. So instead look at this Dusk as either a 1cp 6k who draws a card on entry or a 3cp 6k who draws a card on entry and shoots your opponent for a ton of damage. That is a very good deal. Tempo is everything with a tribal deck. Keeping cards in hand and keeping up good sort of resource economy is very important for if you ever do lose your tribal overlord the reason that the entire deck is being built. Giving the deck another little bit of resistance to removal while also supplementing the number of Warriors of Light in the deck. Two copies of Light Lena. I think I've got another deck in mind for Light Lena as something more of a centerpiece that she's proving very powerful in so far, but in this deck, she's simply great. 
Lena really needs haste to be viable, but when she has haste she is absolutely devastating for being a 3 CP 8k and then holding priority after giving her haste, reanimate something onto the field. Very powerful to be able to play a Warrior of Light, who then often plays you another Warrior of Light, and then Faris is going to get multiple triggers per turn. Immensely powerful. So, uh, yeah, L Lena is at two copies. I don't really like three of any light or dark card unless I have a very strong plan for them or they have an EX symbol up in the corner. But Lena's got some other cute synergies in this deck we'll get to in time. Do not underrate Lena. Really, really powerful card. That is the last of the Warriors of Light I am playing. If I play any more names in here, I feel like I'm diluting the pool of good cards too much, such that we are becoming too tribal, and thus become a lot more vulnerable to removal and whatnot. And I also feel like if I play any more copies of the ones here, I kind of get the same problem. So instead, we're playing a little bit of a selection of situation agnostic good cards in Fire and Water. Three copies of Lani, probably the best Fire forward in Opus 12. She is ostensibly a 0 CP 7k because she kind of draws you a card from entry out of your opponent's deck. She's also concealing information from your opponent that they're going to have to respect and play around depending on what their deck is. And she also knocks 2 CP for you to play the card that she steals off of your opponent. Very powerful card. I absolutely adore her in anything playing fire at the moment and I think you're really missing something if you're not playing her in any fire deck. Since this was a deck that had party attacking as an not unviable option on account of Sol, I wanted to try out Yuna, and I've been very impressed with Yuna. I've had a couple of requests as well for Yuna deck tech talks, and rest assured, I have more in mind for Yuna. Another couple of really cool decks that are abusing her, and uh, one of them a little bit more Gullwing centric, one of them a little bit more party attack centric than even this deck. But she's proved very powerful when it's so easy for us to party attack our various walls together. We've got a lot of uh, lightweight forwards who would want to be party attacking anyway, so it doesn't feel like that much of a cost. Like Sol is very rarely going to attack into an established board on his own but when he attacks in with something else turning an 8k into a 10k and then you also search a card and then enable Yuna to draw you two more cards in second main phase that's very powerful and then Yuna can color shift to be a fire card on the next turn as well if you want her to be able to party attack with anything on your board to then get off those very powerful 8k reductions. Kind of like Cloud of Darkness in Days of Yore and Days of Old in a lot of water decks I feel like if Yuna gets or if she, if she gets the opportunity to or lives long enough to pull off a party attack, you're probably going to win that game because you've removed an awful lot of resources for no real cost with Yuna. Quite powerful. Three copies of Porom, who is doing largely the same job as two copies of Terra. Initially, this was going to be something of a Phoenix deck as well. I thought that a lot of the reasonable Warriors of Light were cost three or so, thereabouts, Dusk especially, and so I thought that 7CP Phoenix into one of those Warriors of Light would be really cool. And then we've got the fallback plan of Phoenix back Porom. Porom, when it dies, can bring back Phoenix to loop relatively endlessly in sort of drawn out games and transition into something of a control deck. I don't think in 15 games or so I cast that 7CP Phoenix once. I was very, very disappointed with it. I think it has kind of had its day. You need to be resurrecting something much, much more broken than a Dusk if you want Phoenix to be good. Playing Zidane during your opponent's turn or replaying a Yurianger to resurrect a Layak or something is probably still a powerful play and in very long games is probably always going to be a good play, but this deck just did not seem like the place for 7CP Phoenix. Could maybe try out a 4CP Phoenix if you just want a sort of infinite blocker in Porom who can eventually give you a different summon if you need a different summon to push for lethal, but I wasn't really blown away by it. However, recurring the summons we do have is very, very important. The last forward, we'll just get him out of the way, one copy of Strago. We have very good name diversity and quite a lot of cost staggering between cost 2, cost 3, cost 4, cost 5 in this deck, so I imagine that a lot of the time Strago will be able to bounce something back to your opponent's hand, and then you slingshot a bit of tempo by dropping another dude in its place. On to the summons. Water has no summons. You cannot change my mind. Water summons are absolutely garbage for the time being. The only summon that is seeing any real play in any competitive deck is 3CP Fampret, but I think that 3CP Fampret is a very bad card in a deck that is looking to maintain a board presence, and in particular relies on your count of forwards to do something with that number in the end. The only remote synergy for Fanfrit in this deck is you could Fanfrit to kill your own Porom to get back another summon, but if that summon is going to be another Fanfrit, you're still running into the same problem, except this time you don't have a Porom. So there are no summons in water. I tried to put in water summons, I tried to put in Bismarck as a combat trick, but Belias in fire was just better. We desperately need more summons in water. Uh, it's, it's definitely becoming a problem, and I don't think Mono Water has been a good deck for at least a third of the game's lifetime because of this. 
However, the fire summons are absolute dope. The most important one here is Amaterasu. Amaterasu is one of the most played cards of this opus, very useful against all manner of combo decks that rely on uh, counting up your powerful on-entry abilities and auto abilities. It gives a very bare bones aggro strategy a bit of resilience against 7cp backup Shantotto. Initially Amaterasu was at 2 to make room for 2 copies of the 7cp Phoenix, but when I realised that card was garbage, I went up to 3 Amaterasu and never looked back. It's a very respectable card with Terra and Porum as well being able to loop it, and your opponent will have to start respecting the things that they can and can't do, otherwise they're going to throw a whole load of CP into a hole in the ground and never get anything back from it. 3 copies of Belias the Gigas. Initially I was playing uh, 2 Phoenix, 2 Belias, the 1 CP1, and then 2 Amaterasu, but uh, when Phoenix went I started asking a few deeper questions about the deck in general. I was misled into thinking this would be a much more aggressive deck, and I think that was because of the way that previous Aegis and Sol played, just as a kind of a big, stompy, relatively mindless deck, and mindless decks like the ability to beat blockers for only 1 CP, so I was playing the other, Belias. And while this is an aggressive deck, it's actually a lot more combo oriented and a lot more value oriented than I expected, and it turns out that combo decks love the ability to give haste. There are times where you can haste your Yuna and party attack with her by playing her in main phase 1. Sure, you're foregoing the two cards there, but you're turning on her removal ability instead. There are times that you want to give one other thing haste so that Sol has got something to party attack with the turn he enters the field. Maybe most importantly, you've got the ability to give Lena haste as well, so that she's not a sitting duck 3cp 8k with no innate level of protection. So, this Belias came in. It's kind of something I've been trying out in Fire Ice quite a bit. I really like Fire Ice. I really like Braska's Final Aeon. I'm one of the, the few people who does, by the sounds of things. Braska's Final Aeon plus this Belias was a much, much better combo than I expected, just being able to 10k something the turn he enters the field. And it's still a problem for your opponent to answer, except now they've got one less turn in which to do it. So, this Belias came in over 1cp Belias in Fire Ice, and it turns out to just be good everywhere else too. Something a little bit new we got in this opus was an upgrade to Verena from Opus 10. Verena, the goblin empath, can search for any card name or job goblin when she enters the field. The upgrade in question she got is Goblin Princess, as now a searchable backup. Fire Water has never been a particularly amazing combo in FFTCG. I know that there are Palom and Porom enthusiasts who will insist otherwise, and I think that Fire Water Vasoya has been quite a reasonable deck here and there, but a big part of the problem is that it never really had the backup engine to compete unless you just wanted to use Water's draw backups and brute force your way into a decent hand with something like Merylweb or Badaron and whatnot, but Verena being a backup who instantly finds you another backup in a different element is very, very powerful. And that backup as well, I think it's time we talked a little bit about Princess Goblin. I don't think we've ever had in FFTCG, apart from Izana maybe, a 2CP card that searches you a card. Effectively, Princess Goblin is free, if not for the fact that you can't discard your light card for CP. You know, it's, it's going to sit in your hand until you play it. Princess Goblin being a searcher, it really has quite a palpable effect on your hand size for the rest of the game and the quality of plays you are able to make when you purify your deck of one dead card by just taking it into your hand right now. If you desperately need to, I guess you could play the Lena, but I don't rush into playing Lena when I do search her out with Princess Goblin. I just appreciate the fact that if you go one back up on turn one and then Verena Goblin on turn two, Although you're on three backups, you're still on four cards in hand. And sure, one of those cards can't be discarded for CP, but I think it has a real knock-on effect on the purity of your deck and the power of plays you are able to make from then onwards. Two CP searchers are very powerful. This is the first time we've had one on a backup, and that's really worth paying some attention to. As another thing for Verena to search, two copies of the Fire Goblin Monster, another way to give Lena haste, and another way to turn any of your combo pieces on. Don't waste your haste resources, don't use them on some random thing for the sake of dealing damage. This is a much more intellectual and a much smarter and much more combo oriented deck than I expected it to be. And sure, once upon a time, I, when I, this was maybe just an aggro deck back in Opus 7 playing Warriors of Light, then you haste whatever you want because the game needs to be over quickly because otherwise you're going to lose. But now, it's so much more fun and so much more interactive than I expected. Hasting the right thing at the right time is definitely the right thing to do. And Verena, I guess the second copy if it lands in your damage zone or something, now is usually going to have a target for you to search out. Since all of the summons in this deck are fire, most of the rest of the fire backups we're playing interact with our fire summons. Three copies of Black Mage. 
if you wanted to cut down on the Terra and the Porom and maybe the Lani or something like that, though don't cut down on Lani too hard, you could probably play Marsh Ritz in its place because Black Mage is a very good enabler for Marsh and also there's the Alchemist back up in Water who also is FFTA to reduce the price of your Marsh. So that's quite powerful and I imagine it's also playable alongside the Warrior of Light engine, although I kind of prefer having these EX bursts that give me a little bit more of a control plan to protect my board when time goes by. One copy of Saz, one copy of Mitty. They are virtually the same backup, except Saz has an EX but costs one more CP. I would much rather play one of each of these than two of any one of these, just because in the situations where they are the only two backups in your hand, you can still play both of them and probably play a normal game of FFTCG as a result. Amaterasu and Belias de Gigas are our only targets, but they're very good targets. I'll finish off the fire backups, because why not? Two copies of Meath. This was initially at 1, but the more I played with this deck, the more I realised that it really liked to see the right card at the right time, and turning a dead for now copy of Amaterasu into your first copy of a 3CP Warrior of Light, or your, your first Dusk or something, is really quite strong. And it's another slight combo, if you're not ready for your copy of Lena yet that you searched out with Princess Goblin, it lets you turn it into a live card as well, or turn into a Yuna or something like that. So Meath is quite powerful in decks who expect to see a light card early, that is never more expected than when we're playing Princess Goblin. Another little combo I should point out, Lena and Princess Goblin have got a cute little synergy together. Princess Goblin dies when a light forward enters your field, but Lena also counts your backups whenever she enters the field. You can resolve these abilities in whatever order you want. You can say Lena gets counters equal to your number of backups and then lose the Princess Goblin. So that is maybe important to keep note of. Four more backups, all in water because we've been kind of neglecting them a little bit. One copy of Artemision to mulligan away cards. It's another way that we can use a light Lena that we search out if we happen to search out too early for us to want to play it and ruin one of our own backups in the process. One copy of Aria 3, Searcher for Warriors of Light. I think that we need to diversify our backup names because this is not just an aggro deck and it doesn't just rely on seeing one particular opening hand. Aria 3 can search for, well, quite a lot of things as you have so far seen. One copy of Leonora. I did consider putting in the backup Porom maybe as a one-off or something because it does remove itself after all, but it just wasn't important and I felt like Verena Goblin was enough of a backup searching engine alongside stuff like Artemisian. And then we've got one copy of Captain Olimar here who is a water backup who can tap for fire CP. The fact that uh, we've got a kind of an imbalance of water and fire means that I think these backups that are dual element are at a little bit more of a premium than they are normally. This is my take on Waterfire Warriors of Light. I really hope you've enjoyed the experience. I hope you're happy that this is finally a tribal deck that I consider to be playable, and I hope you consider it tribal enough for any Warrior of Light enthusiasts out there. Thanks a lot again. Please leave your comments, please leave your thoughts, please leave any justifications for cards you think that deserved a place in the deck, and I will be glad to write back to each and every one of you. Thank you very much. Cheers again. Bye-bye.